All right, we're going to get started. My name is Derek Mosley. I'm the director of uh, Marquette Law School's Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education. And I want to welcome you all to our On the Issues program today, an ounce of summer prevention. Um, I also want to let you know um, that uh, if you're on our mailing list and if you're here, you're probably already on our mailing list. But to keep an eye out, because we're starting to finalize our fall programming, we have some good things coming up. Um, some more on the issues like this program right now. We also have our Get to Know program, which is new, where we bring in individuals who uh, have an effect on your life every day, but you probably don't know who they are. It's a little bit less formal than this type of uh, environment. It's just two of us sitting on a, on a couch talking about what they do and, and uh, taking questions from the audience later. We also have planned for the fall, which has been really popular since I've been here, is our heritage dinners. Um, our purpose of our heritage dinners is to bring people of different political ideologies, backgrounds, social, economic backgrounds together in a room to talk. Um, we are fortunate today because um, we have with us today uh, the namesake of this center and the, the benefactor that allow us all to be here, Mr. Shell Lubar. So we And the one thing I remember when I met with Shell to interview for this position is he said something to me that resonated with me. He said, when you come here, bring in type of programming that brings different people together. We don't live together, our kids don't go to schools together, and we do very little together as a community. And so that, Shell, I'm hoping to do with this programming here and our, um, our heritage dinners. It's Latino Heritage Month this fall. So we will have Mexican, Puerto Rican, Peruvian uh, chefs preparing meals that were introduced to the American palate by um, those cultures. Uh, we, what we say our model is meet someone, learn something, try everything. Mm -hmm. And so you come on in, you're gonna meet people you don't know, you're gonna sit, you're gonna break bread, you're gonna fellowship, and hopefully you leave with a new friend. So um, to keep an eye out for our programming, but we're here today because um, if you talk to anybody in the courthouse, whether it's judges, whether it's attorneys, um, when summer comes around, there's a lot of trepidation about what's going to happen in the summer. And that's because typically in the summer, crime tends to tick up in the summer for obvious reasons. Days are longer. Uh, days are hotter. People are outside. They're uh, in their front yards, backyards, playgrounds, you name it. And those social encounters sometimes can result in things happening. And so we wanted to bring together two of the top law enforcement officials in the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County to discuss these issues, and then we'll take some questions uh, towards the end. Um, so let me start with the introductions. And uh, I'm going off because I think I feel I know you both well enough I can do that. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, city of Milwaukee Police Chief Jeffrey Norman. Just tell you a little bit about uh, Chief Norman. Chief Norman started with the Milwaukee Police Department in 1996. When he was in the police department, he went from officer to detective to lieutenant until, sept I think it was 2020, he was appointed um, assistant chief in the Milwaukee Police Department. Later that year, in December of 2020, he was named the acting chief of the Milwaukee Police Department. And then finally, after serving that for a whole year, mm -hmm. in November of 2021, he became, he was sworn in as the chief of the city of Milwaukee Police Department. Jeff has um, his bachelor's in criminal justice, master's in public administration, um, hey. and he's a graduate of this fine law school. So <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Norman. <laughs> and I want to introduce you to my friend as well, uh, Sheriff Ball. So Sheriff Ball, you may or may not know him. I'm going to tell you some facts that you may or may not know about Sheriff Ball. She grew up in rural Arkansas. And she lived with her grandmother, and unfortunately her grandmother passed away. And as a result of her grandmother passing away, um, Sheriff Ball went into the foster care system and spent some time in several foster homes. Uh, but despite that, she championed on to get her bachelor's in criminal justice, get her master's in criminal justice administration. Um, and then she went to work for the Milwaukee Police Department and served in that capacity, I believe, for 25 years. Is that correct? So for 25 years, served with the Milwaukee Police Department, and then she retired from the Milwaukee Police Department and took a position as the head of criminal justice programs at Bryant and Stratton College. And I got many a phone call from her to come over to talk to the <laughs> students at Bryant and Stratton. 
Um, and then she has a new title, had a new title when she took over that position. She's now also Dr. Danita Ball, as she received her PhD from Cardinal Stritch University. Poor Stritch. <laughs> but uh, Sheriff Lucas, her predecessor, had asked her to be the second in command while he was the sheriff, and she took him up on that offer and was the deputy sheriff. And then when he stepped down, uh, she decided to run for the position, and in November of 2022, uh, ran for that position and won and became the first African-American female to be elected sheriff in the state of Wisconsin. So, thank you. so I want to thank you both for being here, uh, for taking part in this programming. So I'd like to start this way just because as someone who um, brings city and county officials into the rooms together, I think it's appropriate that we clarify what everyone does. Because I know when I was a municipal judge, everybody thought I was a circuit court judge. And, <laughs> you know, when you're a police officer, everything's the sheriff and vice versa. So I'm going to start with you, Sheriff Ball. Um, could you tell us what's the primary responsibility of the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Department? Sure. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. So the sheriff is responsible for the airport for security in the courts, for the expressway and county roads, as well as uh, the parks and um, the uh, detention center, which is our jail. So those are our primary responsibilities. Okay. And Chief Norman, your responsibilities are pretty much everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Taking right out of my mouth. <laughs> In fact, it is interesting because per state statute, because we're a class A city, we do have countywide jurisdiction, which is uh, definitely, a, uh, um, I guess, a huge task, but, you know, leave it to the sheriff to really take on that responsibility. But, you know, we do have a good cooperative nature in regards to us working together besides the jail, you know, staffing, but uh, in regards to the work that needs to be done in regards to safety for our city. So. And you brought up something interesting. You brought up staffing. So law enforcement agencies all across the country are looking to hire. Hmm. So how are your staffing levels right now, both at the Sheriff's Department and also at the uh, Police Department? Well, I think like all other law enforcement departments and Sheriff Ball can agree that we are always recruiting, always in need of more. Uh, recently we had a um, pretty big retirement uh, group in the last couple of years in regards to those who are able to retire. But also we also have to understand the resignations there is Unfortunately, I like to say a little bit of a uh, recruitment fight between a lot of departments in regards to that uh, the pool is not as large. And so you have individuals going to different departments. You do have individuals who are just getting out of the profession altogether. I will say that we've been pretty robust in regards to our recruitment. Uh, the Fire and Police Commission just allowed for a, um, re a continuous recruitment process going on. So that will help because normally, and this is where we have to be innovative and look for, uh, for prior practice was you do a test every two, three years. Um, you have a, a large pool of individuals who are on a list or eligib eligibility list, uh, but it was not truly um, addressing the staffing needs because someone could be on that list for a couple of years and to think that someone will wait you know, two or three years to go into an academy class, uh, not only is I think disrespectful, but uh, not getting with the times. And so with this ongoing recruitment process, it will help speed up and also uh, fill up our classes that uh, we've been blessed with in regards to our common council, support of the mayor, to continue to have more classes in the future. Sheriff, you have the jail. So I know the jail has some uh, staffing issues, if you can elaborate. Sure. Uh, and that robust recruitment that he's talking about, uh, he's poaching from our, <laughs> our area. So. The fight begins! <laughs> putting it out there. <laughs> but uh, as far as uh, jail is concerned, it, it has been one of our greatest challenges. Uh, our staffing, when it seems like it's going to get better, will take two steps forward and one step backwards. And that's because uh, a lot of our COs are using the jail as a stepping stone to go into law enforcement. And so either we will take them into our academy or they go over by Milwaukee, <laughs> and uh, and so um, it has been has been a gradual process. We're making improvement as far as uh, our deputies. We are down about 37, and so really our deputy 
recruitment uh, hasn't uh, been as bad as uh, our CO recruitment. And so, as you know, we've tried innovative things such as uh, hiring on the spot, uh, those with our job fairs. It's been uh, fruitful. However, uh, some people decide that, hey, I'm only doing this so that I can uh, fulfill my unemployment uh, responsibility, or um, they don't get back with us with the necessary paperwork. And so, it's, we've been put putting forth a lot of effort and haven't been bearing as much fruit as we would like, but uh, we're moving in the right direction. And one thing I hear a lot when it comes to uh, police officers and sheriff deputies is there been a, an effort to recruit uh, from the city of Milwaukee in regards to uh, people of color, women, into those departments? We've had uh, huge success with that, actually. Our last couple of classes had not only the diversity, but also those who are coming from our community. And I believe that having an ongoing rolling um, recruitment will assist in that lift. Um, it is important to understand that, you know, we do have a lot of talent within our city and that we should be uh, intentional and embracing. So I am pleased to see that uh, the numbers, we have the 20, I mean, 30 by 30 commitment, which is, you know, 30% uh, uh, female um, recruits within our classes by 2030. So the Milwaukee Police Department, amongst other departments across the nation, have signed on to that. And uh, we really put in a lot of effort into that uh, recruitment videos, working hand in hand with the Fire and Police Commission. Because as uh, people may believe, they think that the Milwaukee Police Department is the recruitment body responsible for it. No, it's our Fire and Police Commission. And the Milwaukee Police Department assists in that particular effort using you know, other recruitment tools, but it is actually the Fire and Police Commission's sole responsibility for testing and also hiring. And as far as uh, the uh, Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, we're doing a better job as it relates to uh, women and uh, diversity on the uh, agency. We've uh, seen where we have been intentional regarding our recruitment and our hiring, and so that has helped a lot. Um, it's better than what it uh, was in the past, but it um, can be even more um, robust than what it is now. We do want to bring people from the community into um, the sheriff's office because I think it's important that they invest in um, you know, what we're trying to do. And a lot of people are willing to uh, you know, criticize, rightly so at, at times, but they're not willing to step up. And we're hoping that we have more people who are willing to step up and be part of the solution. Um, and so uh, it's uh, better than what it has been. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this summer. We're all, everybody in this room is probably familiar with um, the situation of the Christmas parade in Waukesha as well as the 4th of July parade down in Highland Park, Illinois. And so Milwaukee is an interesting city in the summer because we have these large scale public events that take place, whether it's Summerfest, whether it's the ethnic festivals, and this year we have the Harley anniversary taking place. Mm -hmm. So um, from those instances that we've talked about in Waukesha and Highland Park, what procedures have changed or what have you done differently or may do differently in regards to the events that are taking place down at the lakefront, uh, the summer fresh grounds, and also throughout the city? Well, from the Milwaukee Police Department standpoint, we have a pretty robust extra duty system, um, captains who are working with our community to identify needs, identify what we would consider to be weak points. But let me be clear, you know, situations like Highland Park, they're really hard to plan for. I mean, if you think about the dynamics of what happened there, you had someone who was, you know, in a, in a residence, you know, from a window. I mean, those are really those difficult things to plan for. What you can do is be, again, proactive. Uh, we usually put, you know, whether it's barriers at, you know, the uh, entry and exit spots for, you know, our particular outside ventures, having, you know, a robust and, uh, you know, um, uh, you can see a visible presence, but uh, I like to know, and I know we're going to talk about the violent crime plan at some point, partnerships with our community. Um, I really want us to be the kind of the backdrop rather than the front drop. Working with our partners, I know that we have an upcoming Juneteenth, you know, having their own security, and we work in tandem so that basically it's not, you know, the omnipresent type of, you know, policing of heavy, but visibility, proactive, with a smile but also understanding that you're only as good as the other eyes and ears that you can rely on. And so for us to really truly have a safe and secure 
uh, um, particular type of uh, venues, and we work again hand in hand with Summer Fest. We have you know a lot of our specialty units working with them, but it's you all. You're all the eyes and ears. You know this is where we really have a true impactful security you know plan is that you see something say something. Don't think it's somebody else's responsibility to kind of say, hey, this seems out of place or weird. This is really where the you know, ability of collaborative approach can really maximize in regards to that. You know, if somebody leaves a bag somewhere that kind of looks unusual, don't just kind of take it as, eh, looks a little strange, but it's gonna be all right. Report that, because that information helps us be better. And so when we have these you know, outdoor activities, it's really a collaborative approach. It's a, you know, let's work together because I always say, and the Dean of Power would say this, we are information driven. Only the information again, whether it's a phone call, someone saying something, someone passing it on, helps us to be better and more responsive to the needs of our community. And I agree with what um, Chief Norman has uh, stated. We're trying uh, to do a better job uh, with collaboration, instead of just working in our individual silos, we're reaching out to our partners because we are better together and then we can multiply our resources when we do that. And we, just to be uh, honest, we rely on the different municipalities to assist us because we can't uh, be every place. And so we are working more closely with them. We start out uh, early so that we can get the planning uh, in place so that we can address the issues that we know are coming forward. But you know, we look back at what happened in the past to see uh, how we can do it better um, this time. Right. And so um, we're also training with a lot of our um, entities, even with the park rangers, we are training with them uh, just so that we're on the same page because we want to make sure that people who are using our parks, driving on our expressway, et cetera, are safe. And so it is important that we work collaboratively. But as um, Chief Norman stated, working with you, law enforcement, it, everything shouldn't be on law enforcement's shoulders. Everybody bears responsibility for the safety of this community. And so it's very important that we work uh, in conjunction with each other. We know that there are uh, groups that are out there that are also working to uh, make sure that we have a safe community. Mm -hmm. And all of that is important, you know, um, but uh, it's more about the collaboration and working not only with our law enforcement partners, but also working with you. You brought up a good point that I think it needs to be clarified. You are the sheriff of Milwaukee County, mm -hmm. which is made up of 19 different municipalities. Right. And each one of those municipalities has their own law enforcement agency. Right. So you work with them to cover that part of the, the county that you don't have to cover. Exactly, and if you look at, just looking at the parks, it's over 150 parks. There's no way that we can uh, police all 150 parks, well, 150 plus parks, yeah. or uh, over 150 miles of expressway. Yeah. So we have to work in tandem, tandem with our um, other law enforcement partners so that we can make sure that we're maximizing our efforts. We're putting our resources where they are most deserved and where we can have the greatest impact, but it takes all of us. Yeah. So, um, Chief, you mentioned the fact that you work with uh, different organizations, and I look out into the room, I see Safe and Sound, Safe and Sound. <laughs> I see Justice Point, yeah. I see people in the, in the building that you work with. Can you tell us what that looks like, what these collaborations with these groups look like? So it helps with our community engagement. I know a lot of times people cringe when I say that, like, wow, community engagement, like this some popcorns and lollipops and balloons. It's more than that, you know, I see WCS in the house. It's being able to have real time engagement. This is engagement, talking to you all, getting the feedback. We are able to get the best way to utilize services when we get the interactions between you, the public, and also us who is responsible for giving the best service to the public. So using vehicles such as Save and Sound, those are engagement um, uh, uh, points for you know, dealing with our youth or dealing with our residents. You know, they're able to do surveys, have different listening sessions. It's beyond just the you know, yearly national night out of, uh, on August uh, having a resource table, but being able to be in rooms where normally we're not in and having those ability to sit there and say, what are we doing right? Because you know, a lot of people always want to tell you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> what are we doing right that we could do more of? But also, let's, how can we improve? Because it is that type of collaboration that you need to understand how to better, best utilize 
finite resources. I understand that we are stewards of a, you know, uh, you know, have fiduciary obligations that, you know, it's not we got an unending surplus of, you know, financing and the resources that we are bestowed upon. So being able to understand where to best utilize our resources, how to interact and deal with some of the concerns we have out there. Um, our partners are a great vehicle, um, a liaison of sorts, uh, to be able to help us uh, navigate our different, you know, you know uh, neighborhoods, but, uh, you know, even with our municipal partners. I mean, it's beyond the, the borders of Milwaukee is, you know, uh, just, I would like to say, imaginary. Uh, when we have these issues, it's cross, you know, municipalities and borders, and being able to have these particular type of um, coming together with all our different resource partners is really truly impactful. So we, you mentioned this, and I, I actually have a copy of it. You mentioned the violent crime plan. So if you haven't seen it, this is the comprehensive plan that was put out by the Milwaukee Police Department and their violent crime plan. You can go onto their website, Milwaukee Police Department's website, and download it. We downloaded it here. I took a look at it, went through it. And so there's a couple things that you, I hear you spoke about. And for the first quarter of the year, you've mentioned that crime in Milwaukee is actually down about 17%. Mm -hmm. And the homicide rate is actually down a third from where it was the last three years, mm -hmm. correct? And so I was going through the report, and it, it talks about the violent crime rate and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But it's something I wanted to talk to you about because I know um, that your officers aren't just called out to violent crimes. And your deputies aren't just called out to violent crimes. They're called out to overdoses. Mm -hmm. They're called out to people suffering from mental health crises. Mm -hmm. They're called out to homeless mm -hmm. individuals in our community. Mm -hmm. So what training are the deputies and the officers getting to deal with this demographic? So for us, um, there's so many different trainings. And one of the things I want to make clear, the violent crime plan does not absolve us responsibility for all those other things you just described. Um, but this is that canary in the mind that we're seeing not only in our community but across the country. Uh, seeing the de devastating effects of firearm use and the ways they are being utilized. And so while we, you know, uh, are aware of this, we don't shelve all the other things in regards to, you know, dealing with some of our homeless challenges or dealing with issues of reckless driving and whatnot. Uh, we have extensive training for the Milwaukee Police Department. I mean, I can go through a whole bevy of CIT, crisis intervention uh, training, or talking about de-escalation training, or talking about in regards to just a lot of other uh, training that uh, it really um, enhances our officers' abilities. But, uh, but for those who don't know, because, okay. I mean, there are people in, in the building who aren't part of the law enforcement field. So when you say CIT training, could you yep, elaborate on that? So, we have CIT training, which is a basic 40-hour, uh, which is a, before my time of being in the chief's position, crisis intervention, intervention training. This is how to deal with those in crisis moments, mental health issues. Uh, the uh, two chiefs ago had made the uh, commitment to have the entire department trained in that particular type of uh, uh, um, work or understanding that type of lift. And we also have, uh, again, a, a more um, extensive uh, CIT training for uh, those who do more of the work. I mean, we have um, those who are working on the hot team, homeless outreach teams. Uh, so this is, helps us as a department be uh, more aware of the uh, sensitivities, uh, the engagement, um, give us uh, points in regards to how to engage, but also we listen to people from the mental health community. Um, so this is something that helps in regards to those particular um, personal engagements, enhances those teams that we have. We have, like I said, the HOT team, Homeless Outreach Team. It's a, a partnership with a social worker. But we also have the CART team, which is the, uh, my goodness, I got so many acronyms in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Crisis Assessment Response. There we go, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a dollar friend, you know, <laughs> that is right, right next to me. But that is also dealing with those who are going through a mental health challenge. I mean. This is a officer who is paired up with a uh, social worker. So we are pretty, I think, ahead of the curve of a lot of the work that we do um, that a lot of other departments are not even in that particular um, uh, uh, position to have specialty uh, groups to be able to handle and deal with these particular issues. Do we have enough? No. I mean, it's always a challenge in regards to the type of cause and, and, and the um, you know, need that's out there, which is why we're always part of a lot of different conversations about alternative methods, being open to it. 
but it's easier said than done. Uh, the uh, rules of engagement is not as easy as to kind of say flick the switch, but we're all open to uh, working with those who are subject experts, those who don't have to have you know, weapons on their side to be able to engage in you know, those particular type of work. Because I do really do believe in that uh, sworn officers should be doing sworn things. But until the meantime, because unfortunately we only entity has 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, holidays included, work. That, that's something that's uh, you know, a transition sometime in the future. And we have the uh, uh, same uh, type of training, the uh, crisis intervention training, de-escalation. Um, we also have a lot of communication training because it is important that uh, you try to talk that person into compliance. And when um, they decide not to, we also have defense and arrest tactics that we use, um, and it goes up a continuum. But it is important, our training is important because that's what we fall back on, and it helps us uh, when we are negotiating those challenging areas. But um, that communication piece is really important. Uh, and if we can reach somebody uh, just talking to them, that helps. I uh, just had an interview with our CART team. We started a podcast program. Uh, and so one of the things that they said as far as additional training, they were like uh, ne uh, hostage negotiation training. Because if you think about it, uh, you have someone that is not complying with you, with your orders. And so they thought that that uh, training would be beneficial. So although they do have a lot of training, it's never enough, and uh, I would like to give them as much training as possible to help them to do their job more effectively and efficiently. But just as a side note, I just yeah. want to talk about, because I know that there is a big push about training. There's a lot of you know, saying this is what we need, but we also need the right people to be trained. Absolutely. This is sometimes where you miss the boat on this in regards to, well, they just need more training. Sometimes, you know, there's a reason for training. Either they get better or this is what we fall back on for the accountability discipline. And one of the things I've noticed in my short little time being chief is that we got to do a better job of recruiting. We got to recruit the right people. We got to have the individuals who are able to receive and embrace the training. And that is where I think a lot of times we have to really be um, self introspective or introspective, guess, when you say self, to be able to understand that, uh, you know, when you want a certain type of product or a type of uh, officer, or what are we doing for the recruitment aspect? and ensuring that they fit the bill of what our community wants. So we're working on that because I think that really will have a lot more traction in regards to what type of, you know, I want those who want to serve. You know, bringing a culture of service, dedicated service to the Market Police Department, and I have to show that, but also understanding those who embody that and want to really have that level of empathy, compassion, you know, understand what it means to be a servant leader. And so that's where we really can put, you know, a good dent in regards to what type of uh, officers we have in regards to our, our, our respective field, Milwaukee Police Department, Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office. Absolutely. Now there's something that falls into both of your purviews, and we actually hosted here at the Lubar Center a reckless driving task force. Hmm. And so uh, reckless driving is a problem that has affected us here on the Marquette campus. A, a, a dean of the university was struck by a reckless driver and killed. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's important not only to the law school but to the university as a whole. And so what is being done that we may not be aware of in regards to law enforcement, the enforcement piece of the reckless driving issue? Well, on, in February, I um, asked the uh, municipalities, the 19 municipalities, the chiefs or their designee to come and talk about uh, what we're doing as it relates to our reckless driving. And it gave us an opportunity to talk about what the individual municipalities or the county is doing as a whole and so and how we can collaborate. So we do have our own uh, reckless driving initiative where we're using data and identifying those hot uh, zones and uh, the time of day, the type of uh, activity, as well as the day of week. And we are putting our resources in those areas to uh, have an impact uh, on either the reckless uh, behavior or um, the crashes, et cetera. But we also have a collaboration with uh, the Milwaukee Police Department, uh, with the uh, Wisconsin State Patrol, where we, on designated days, we go out and uh, we are actively patrolling, looking for those uh, behaviors. I think it's important 
that uh, we work together. As you know, an auto has no boundaries, mm -hmm. and so it can go any place. And so it's important that uh, we're utilizing our resources. Actually, we're maximizing our resources so that, that, so that we can provide that safety and that security for those who uh, drive on our expressway, on our roads, or are in our parks. So, I mean, I think we've, you know, been doing a good job of pouring out what we're doing, but just as a recap, I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, was a recent, uh, you know, um, allowance uh, last year, May of 2022, the towing policy, uh, something that the Fire and Police Commission uh, was able to support us on in regards to those who are driving with, uh, not without the emergency vehicle, engaging in behaviors such as, you know, reckless driving or uh, fleeing the police or, you know, we're able to tow those vehicles uh, speeding. Uh, it's been uh, pretty robust. I know I think we're almost uh, over 300 uh, tows since that particular um, uh, time. Um, you know, traffic safety unit is still out there uh, engaging in the uh, proactive enforcement. But one of the things I don't think many of you know that we're working with our other municipal partners. Uh, our city borders, you know, the suburbs and having the respective commanders engaged with the Glendale or the Greenfield in regards to cooperative uh, traffic enforcement. Uh, our commanders have been pretty proactive in regards to, you know, understanding again what uh, Sheriff Ball said in regards to there's no boundaries. And so having, you know, um, um, collective enforcement times together has also been a game changer. And so it's uh, important, again, that uh, working with our community, we have the TSU.org uh, website where it's also in, in important to have the information about where we need to be at, uh, the type of visibility, the type of enforcement, because yes, we do have a, um, a crime analyst who goes through the data, looking at you know high crash points and uh, speeding, but it really is impactful to hear from you all in regards to uh, what you all are seeing. I know that, uh, you know again, it's all about being effective and uh, efficient and knowing where we need to be at helps us understand the communication from our residents of saying, we're seeing this type of behavior over here in this particular neighborhood. Um, working with the uh, mayor, uh, working with the uh, different uh, governmental partners, um, DPW, Department of Public Works. I know that we've seen a lot of modifications going, around, going on around our city, roundabout turnabouts and uh, roundabouts, or the bump outs, uh, s narrowing the streets where it's easier for pedestrians to kind of cross, but also, harder to do what we call that baselining, you know, driving into the bicycle lane or the uh, bus lane. So those are things that is a, a comprehensive approach, as you see, whether it's a violent crime plan or reckless driving, it's about a multi-layered approach. No one approach should be the end all or be all. It's all about, again, how do we work with our government partners, how we work with our residents, how we work with our law enforcement partners, because that's where you get the greatest gain, especially in this challenging time of budgets and, and other issues. Uh, being able to collaborate and know how to, you know, you bring the peanut butter, I got the jelly, we make a sandwich. <laughs> and that's basically what we're doing here. And it's nice to be able to have these particular robust relationships. And that, again, is the true game changer. We talk. Mm -hmm. You know, that didn't happen a lot. You know, I, mean, I got, you know, not as many years. No, no, you're only about 10 years in or something. You know, I'm not going to say I don't have as many years as my, my, my companion over here, but <laughs> knowing back in the day, this didn't happen. Whether it's at the state in, in city level, city to county level, you know, we really have some really great relationships out there that really need some time to blossom and, 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 and really be uh, truly impactful. But uh, we're getting there. We're not where we need to be at, but we're getting there. And I think it's appreciative that I can pick up the phone and talk to Sheriff Ball or talk to the mayor or, or talk to uh, uh, Tim Calloran, who's the you know, superintendent of the state patrol. Those are real, real, real relationships that has a lot of benefits. And I'll just add, we also work with our community partners like Sherman Park, et cetera, uh, to address uh, those issues. But we're trying to be more uh, proactive. Um, we are uh, getting ready to implement a teen driving program. It's a d distracted driving program. So um, we're trying to get them before they develop too many bad habits. Right. And um, Starting at 10? <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> they have to be a driving age. You know? <laughs> so uh, we're hoping that um, that is going to uh, 
make a big difference as well. That's true, because there is a lot of work with community groups. I know Tracy Dimps back there did some reckless driving videos, working with Safe and Sound, working with Sherman Park, Vision Zero. I forgot about that whole comprehensive, because I know, you know, I get called out, you're talking about enforcement, what about <laughs> trying to educate and you know, embrace? So absolutely, MPS is a great another partner for driver license too. Mm -hmm. So before I open it up to questions from the audience, I just wanted to ask you both this question and, and see how you respond. What would you consider to be the most pressing concerns affecting your departments? Whether it's staffing, whether it's what you think are the most pressing concerns that you have. I'll start first. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I've said this time and time again, it's trust. Yeah. It's trust that we are doing the right things for the right reasons for you all. That has always been a challenge because we have so many different narratives out there. We have national narratives, we have state narratives, we have local narratives. I ask the same thing that people ask about us about dealing with trauma. We need to work through those things and meet us where we're at in regards to what we're doing. Holding me accountable to another prior predecessor is not only unfair, but it really hampers what we can do moving forward. And the same thing about our officers. You know, we have a different culture in the Milwaukee Police Department. Believe me, accountability is real, but we have a lot of great men and women doing work to keep our community safe, and I stand on that. And it's important for you all to know that this is a different department. It's a different department. Give us that benefit of the doubt. It's a partnership. It's not a one-way vehicle here. And so we can't get to reckless driving. We can't get to violent crime. We can't get to the things that's going on in neighborhoods if we do not trust each other. Our hand is out. Meet us halfway. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rev. <laughs> the hat will be going around. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> No, uh, seriously, uh, trust is very important. But I would definitely say staffing is our biggest challenge because it permeates everything that we do. If we don't have enough staffing, uh, we're, say, um, correction officers, then we have to take our deputies and put them in the jail. That means that we don't have enough staffing in our, in our courts, enough staffing uh, to uh, work at the airport. Uh, patrol is short. So that is uh, one of our biggest problems that we have been dealing with is our staff. And it's not just hiring people, as uh, Chief Norman stated before, we want to hire the right people. Mm -hmm. You know, we want people that are willing to do the job and would do it the way we expect them to do and the way you expect uh, them to do. So it has been our biggest challenge, and it's just not with us. We know uh, across the country in different industries it's a problem, but it is uh, our biggest challenge at this point. All right. So at this time, a program manager for the Lubar Center, Hillary Dubois, has a microphone. If you have a question, she will run over. There's some questions up front. This one first, oh, right. and then I'll go down in front. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, thank you, uh, police chief and our sheriff for your service, because you stand between us <clears throat> and chaos, so thank you for your service. <laughs> I am Dan Steininger, I'm president of the Daniel Hone Foundation, mm -hmm. and I mentioned that because my father, my grandfather was Dan Hone, and in his administration, not only was Milwaukee considered the best man managed city in the nation, but our crime was so low that if we had one murder a year, it was shocking. Mm -hmm. So to that effect, uh, the mayor of our city has declared Milwaukee a war zone when it comes to crime. When the mayor says that, you know you have a serious crime. I don't know what the reporting statistics are, but we know we have a serious problem. And what I've done with the Hone Foundation is launched an initiative in awarding financial grants to our private citizens and to the private sector to come up with ideas to help solve crime. And why? I, I served as the chair of the Port of Milwaukee, and I've learned that in government, you both have identified it, we didn't have the resources to always hire the best and the brightest talent. So what we learned is to work with the private sector. So here's the thought to everyone in this room. Um, go to www.innovatemilwaukee.gov and put your ideas on our website. And to the police chief and to the uh, county sheriff, 
we would like you to listen to those ideas. They'll be announced come fall at the uh, Salute to Government and um, share those with you. Make sure you give publicity to them and take them seriously because you're going to see some ideas that you will never see from the bureaucracies that you head up. You'll see things from the private sector. I only point to the COVID crisis. What solved it? The private sector came up with a vaccine that actually worked. So we'll be coming to you, hopefully in sincere, and please give us the, you know, the time and the attention and to publicize those ideas because we'll give you things that you'll never see otherwise. So there it is, and to everyone in the room, if you care about this, talk to people, the, the smart, the technology people, because you can't solve this by just human beings. You can't solve it by just getting more officers. This has got to take an entire, you're right, an entire community. So there's my, so can you and will you give us that time this fall when we're coming to you all those ideas? Absolutely, and I think that is great because law enforcement don't have all the problems. I mean, all the, well. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> we don't have all the uh, answers. And so I think uh, we probably can get some good ideas from uh, the public that we may have not even thought about or might, even, might not have even considered. So, and it's just being part of the solution. And so I appreciate that. And yes, I will. So same commitment. I did recognize your face. I remember seeing it in the uh, JS online. And uh, I was about to submit something, but I think that might have been unfair. So, <laughs> But I will say this much. I see Aaron Procell here. Um, you know, it's more than just saying the words. You know, we commit ourselves to a focused deterrence program with Mirror. Uh, that should answer you enough in regards that we embrace something different, something new, something more. It's important for us to be able to be receptive and listen to those uh, offerings and, uh, you know, be able to support it. Absolutely. Hi. Um, I also want to thank you for coming. It's very interesting to listen to this. I retired from the city after 30 years, and I've been... Not, <laughs> thank you. Not happy with the fact that the residency requirement, the state won't let us have a residency required for, for City of Milwaukee jobs. And I'm wondering, Chief Norman, if you know what percentage of the police department doesn't live in the city anymore, and do you think that affects their ability to protect those of us who do when they are living in other cities, they choose not to live here? Just if you have anything to say about that. So the first thing I say is that I still live in the city. And Me so too. basically that, 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 that comes in, you know, that uh, viewpoint. Uh, we, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, 50-50 or maybe just a little bit over 50% uh, in regards to those live outside the city. But I will say, and again, those are just approximations, so I know I got the news up in here. Don't, don't <laughs> quote me too much in regards, but I know that we're somewhere around that. But I will answer this quite frankly that, you know, whether you live in the city or out, the service and expectation of the service remains the same under my watch, under the watch of our leaders of the Milwaukee Police Department. It is important for us not to, you know, get into a dialogue of, you know, I mean, it was uh, earned or, you know, fought for whatever they did in regards to, you know, the um, residency thing, but it doesn't change the expectations. And that is the most important aspect in regards to service. I said a culture of dedicated service. And it means that no matter where you live, you better bring the best version of you to work today because I believe in coaching, mentoring, facilitating, but I also believe in accountability. And that if you have did the wrong things in regards to the public safety and service that we expect out of you, there is really accountability. I mean, we put it on our website in regards to items of accountability each quarter in regards to what I feel about you know, those who do not do the right or correct service to our public. And I mean that and I stand on that. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'll have you next. Hello, uh, my name is Tracy Dent. Um, you talked about uh, large venues and how, how to, uh, you know, control it or, you know, police it. Have you ever thought about putting um, uh, officers in plain clothes to walk around so, you know, if somebody's doing dirt, they'd be looking to see if there's police around. But if you see police, you have police officers in plain clothes, then that, you know, they'd be more able to maybe stop something before something happens. Um, so that's one thing. Also, you talk about... Well, let's stop. Let's, let, 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 we're gonna, just one question. We've got a lot of people. We'll, we'll go to that question first. Okay. And um, as uh, 
Chief Norman was stating it's a multi-layered approach. And so, yes, we do have officers out there in uniform for that visibility to deter that crime of opportunity, but we also have people in plain clothes mm -hmm. that are going through the crowds and uh, seeing if there's something uh, that someone is doing that is criminal and uh, is uh, impacting others, and so we'll take actions that way. But yes, we do that. There's Especially people in plain clothes in here right now. <laughs> <laughs> right now. I can one see more. that right now. <laughs> one, just one so, more thing. So, just well, one Tracy, thing. I'm going to come back to you because I want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to ask, but we'll come back because this gentleman was actually next. Oh, we got you. No, we actually turn those off. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. David from Wauwatosa. Um, I worked secure, private security for CBS in the riots in 2020 and 2021. Who, not to put you on the spot, I'm all about law enforcement, a military retired, United States Army retired. Who comes in and says, let's, let's let them... I hate to say riot, let's let them do what they do and then we're gonna put the clamps down on uh, at this time after this amount of time or if something happens. Who, and I don't need names, but what, what entity tells you to lay off and then to put a stop to it? So first of all, thank you for your service. Appreciate that. Um, being part of a lot of different unfortunate civil unrest back in the 2020, I was only a commander at the time. Um, but there are rules of engagement. I mean, you serve in the military, understand in regards to that there has to be, you know, what triggers what. Um, reviewing things and understanding that um, you can't predetermine someone's going to do something. And you have to be very careful in regards to what is a peaceful protest considered to what we will consider to be a riot. And also, what is your term or your definition of a riot? I know that uh, when you start to see destruction or harm, that needs to be intervened. But you can't anticipate that. You can say, hey, we were prepared, but for the rules of engagement, especially this is a, we are a community of neighbors, and I mean, it's, it's not like you're dealing with, you know, some alien force. So you have to be very careful about what and how you engage, what's gonna be the rules of engagement, and that you're able to stand on solid ground saying that this is the behavior we see and that's what we're here to disrupt or interrupt. Now, we do have a pretty robust, what we call the Fusion Center, where we check and looking at what the you know, information and communications out there. If someone is trying to you know, say, hey, we're gonna come at this particular location to disrupt, we do a little bit of prevention, going out and deal with those individuals, meeting with them, talking to them. But uh, as uh, I've always said, I'm not gonna allow uh, death or destruction under my watch. Uh, I think it's important to make that statement because you know this is a community where we understand we need to be civil to one another, respect freedom of speech, you know is protected. I'm a lawyer, but it doesn't open you know anything goes afterwards in regards to those particular behaviors that will harm others or property. Hello, um, you mentioned the teen driving program. I'm wondering if you have any other youth programs that you're involved with. We work in conjunction, a lot of the, the uh, community engagement that we have, we work in conjunction with the municipalities, work very closely with the police department. We also have our Explorers program, and this is, um, is youth, uh, I think, from the ages of uh, 14 to um, 18, and so we uh, work very closely with them. I think it's important that we start changing the uh, minds of our youth as to how they relate to police. So we're looking at other um, ways in which we can interact with, um, with our youth. Um, Tracy has already contacted us as well as other community groups regarding uh, how we can uh, be partners and uh, work collaboratively to address some of the issues that we're seeing uh, involving our youth and that trust factor that uh, um, Chief uh, Norman talked about earlier. So we work with a number of different um, community groups. I mean, Boys and Girls Club of America, we work with uh, Safe and Sound, um, but the biggest thing that I'm happy with is that we reintroduced POW, Police Athletic League. And uh, this is a rebirth after being dormant for almost 20 years in regards to that this is a, you know, 2.0. 
this is something that has the support of, uh, you know, our rank and file and also our community partners. Because we do understand we need to be engaged with our youth, engaged in regards to having meaningful engagement beyond just, you know, uh, handing out baseball cards or having something that is uh, not as intentional where we can say we have Friday night uh, uh, get-togethers with youth. We do a lot of out, you know, outdoor activities with the youth. So it's definitely a very robust uh, programming that we got going on within the Market Police Department. Hi, um, Rose Spang, and I'm from Franklin. Um, in the, around the 70s, we had a um, mental health association in Milwaukee County. Are you familiar with the fact that we had a mental health association? Okay. Yeah. Um, what they did, and what we did, because I was part of the program, um, we would go to different agencies and schools and departments and uh, talk with them about mental health and how to educate people about it. And we went to some of the police departments too. But now there isn't an association like that anymore. And it seems, I don't, and I don't know why it, it went away, but it seems that we need something like that now and we don't have it anymore. So how, how can we get something like that back to help? Because some of the people that you are arresting and taking, they have mental health issues, a lot of them. Appreciate and the question, but if you know about it, why don't you do it? Pardon? I said, if you know about it, why don't you do it? Well. I mean, just being honest. Maybe I, I will. We, we, as a police department, our wheelhouse is law enforcement. Yeah. Therapy, you know, so, I mean, we help and we be a part of it. But one of the things I tell my team is we're not concierge, though, and try to do things outside of our wheelhouse. So I know I heard a couple of wow, it's, it's not being disrespectful. It's just being honest. We need to understand this is what we do in regards to law enforcement. We see certain issues, bring it to the table, but their solutions, just as Mr. Hone talked about, bring it to us and how can we partner with you then owning it to do the work and then try to figure out, muddle through it and not truly be that subject matter expertise performance you're looking for. I don't think our public wants that. And especially with all the things I'm hearing in regards to this, being able to stay in our lane, I want my or our department to stay in their lane, be supportive to groups such as that, and be able to say, this is what we can bring, whether it's data or our own intel or experience, so that we can support what your efforts are to be whole or be, be uh, as effective as possible out there. I but, have a whole, I have a whole big bunch of program on it, and I'll show it to you. Absolutely. But, but also in fairness, um, the iteration that you mentioned may not still exist, but there's partners in this house right now, WCS, Justice Point, uh, NAMI, um, Grand Avenue. There's a number of organizations that work with the system, whether it's judges, prosecutors, and law enforcement. There might not be that iteration, but there are still out there. So don't think that there's nothing, nothing out there. Yeah. Thank, thank you for mentioning uh, Grand Avenue and NAMI. Uh, they've been in the mental health field for decades. Um, we're all concerned about gun crime. Um, the thing that puzzles me the most is that possession of a firearm by a convicted felon is a 10-year federal felony. It's also a 10-year sentence under the state criminal code. Yet I'm seeing news articles constantly about people being charged with a felon in possession of a firearm, and the sentences seem to be rather minuscule. Rather than 10 years, you don't see judges even giving five years. So the people who are illegally carrying the guns know that apparently they can get away with it because the sentences are so minuscule. What I'm proposing is that the next one of these events bring the judges in. The judges are the ones who are the ones deciding whether or not these dangerous people are going to roam around on our streets or not. The best police work in the world is not going to be enough if a judge decides to give somebody a slap on the wrist for a really violent felony. So I would ask you to take a close look at the charges for felon in possession of a firearm 
and see what kind of charges are actually being issued, not plea bargaining them down to a disorderly, and to see what actual sentences the judges are imposing. Good to see you, Dean. Oh, he's right there. I'm sorry. Hi, Dr. David Franchek here. I just want to let you know that we do have a very vibrant uh, mental health uh, association, the Mental Health America of Wisconsin, uh, operating right now. I'm formerly the president of that group, and it would be a good one for you to collaborate with. So I'll just right. let you know. Appreciate that. And that's the purpose of these events. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we'd love to. Okay. Yeah, we'll take two more questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, piggybacking on what the gentleman on the, on the end said, I see guns on the streets as a huge problem here. And what strategies do you have available to put a dent in this problem? So, again, in the violent crime report, we are a number of different multifaceted strategies, one from education to accountability. Um, from an education aspect, again, uh, you know, we do have care and conceal. Uh, it's important for us to talk about in regards to those who are responsible to secure your weapon, not only not in your vehicle, but also in the home. We're seeing all type of negligence on the part of uh, accessibility to our young ones, accessibility to others who should not have it in possession. So again, the Violent Crime Plan is a comprehensive look at. You know, we do have what's called the Public Safety Review. Each week, we have a collaboration with all different partners, Department of Corrections, the, uh, the, the, uh, the District Attorney's Office, ATF, um, housing, in regards to dealing with those who are harming our community, you know, bringing violence. And we have a focus in regards to the County Sheriff's is part of that weekly review of going and being focused in regards to those particular behaviors. Uh, we also have a response to those who are uh, trying to obtain guns illegally through the uh, gun stores. Uh, there's a number of people who are doing straw purchasing or felon possessions. And so we are actually investigating and we have what's called a firearm denial program where we are getting you know, those who are trying to go to the Cabela's or Dunham's shooter shop. Uh, we get video, we go and follow up. We have very great success in regards to getting those who are attempting to um, uh, 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 purchase guns for someone else or for themselves have been a straw purchaser. Uh, last thing is, and this is something that uh, is a, a nice report out, we collaborate with our businesses. Uh, downtown we did a business collaboration uh, looking at in regards to the uh, motor vehicle um, break-ins, auto break-ins. Double digit reductions in regards to, you know, um, having that type of messaging, uh, cooperation with what we call target hardening, uh, the uh, parking lots and working with between the market police department and the businesses, but also the messaging, you know. Uh, don't leave these valuable items un unattended. And we've seen double digit reductions in, in not only the, uh, guns stolen from our vehicles, but also in regards to auto break-ins in the downtown area. True collaboration, multifaceted, different points, no one particular uh, uh, work is going to be the end all be all, but as we have all these different type of points, you see the results. And so this intentionality of seeing these numbers go down within our crime, I never say it's MPD alone, it's not MCSO, it's not MFD, it's all of us. And just to add to what uh, Chief Norman stated, we uh, each, both of us work with the FBI, um, they have a gun. Uh, crimes initiative and we work in conjunction with them so that we can multiply our resources and get more guns off the street so we've, we're trying to be intentional about uh, how we approach it we don't want to violate someone's rights but we know that it's a safety issue and we're doing what we can uh, and using that collaboration as well legislation could help too yes absolutely absolutely Thank you. I'm Andy. I live in Glendale, have been living in the Milwaukee area for, I don't know, 55 plus years. Um, it's very nice that you have a forum like this where we can ask you questions, but you really need a places where we can actually have an open discussion rather than just ask a question and you quickly reply on one. But to the key points, um, I see two major issues that we all face today is one, obviously there's way too many guns out there and unless Every time you discuss problems with crime, 
you guys don't say that we got to get the guns off the streets, nothing is going to get resolved. I understand that the criminals should not own weapons, but they're not the only ones that are killing people. There are people who have never been criminals before to get a hold of a Uzi, essentially, and shoot up a whole bunch of people. You cannot allow them to have guns because they've never been a criminal before and then get a machine gun to shoot people practically. Machine That's gun legislation. To shoot people up. That's so not you, the police. That's every legislation. Time, every time we open up a mouth and say that there's a you know, problem with a crime, tell us, tell everybody that we got to get our guns off the streets. The other issue, of course, is the driving. You know, I just picked up a brand new car that I spent $28,000 on. I can guarantee you I'm not going to drive recklessly on with it, okay? But when, you, when somebody, some, some kid, practically steals somebody's car, and of course he goes joyriding and crashes it, you got to put more emphasis on stopping that. And yes, I understand that the two brands are lousy at preventing the thefts of their cars. Whatever happened with the system where you can drive around a city and read off the license plate and find out if that car has been stolen. You gotta go after stolen cars and get them out of the hands of the kids that are gonna go joyriding and kill people with them. So regarding the uh, guns, no, I didn't say it today, but I say it often, that we do have to get the guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them. We have uh, too many juveniles that get a hold of those guns. We have too many people who have mental health issues. There's a prevalence of guns, and if they're not taking them from uh, law-abiding citizens because they went someplace and found out, hey, you can't possess a gun here, and then they watch them go and put them in their vehicle, then they're breaking their vehicle, they're getting them other means. And even kids are uh, getting, babies are getting hold of guns. So we do uh, say that. And we do address the uh, reckless driving. But then you have to be careful. On one hand, you're telling us to address the reckless driving. But if we do, and then um, they run into somebody else and kill them, and then, you know, you're coming back on us. Where's the support? Well, we wanted you to address the reckless driving. We didn't want them to run into anybody else and kill them, which we don't either. But that happens. So we have to I keep saying being intentional. Be intentional about who we chase uh, and the reason why we're chasing them because if something bad happens, we have to be able to say that, uh, you know, this uh, pursuit outweighed, I won't say outweighed, but we took that into consideration, but it was such a dangerous, um, you know, effect to the uh, public that we needed to uh, stop this person. Oh, hold up. Nope, 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 nope. Not, not, no, no, sir. No, sir. All right. Um, we're, we're at our time, and I apologize that we've gone a little bit over. I want to thank the chief, Chief Norman and Sheriff Ball for being here today. I want to thank program manager Hillary DuBlois. And always thank you, Shell Lubar. We'll see you soon. Thank you.